2007 novel, Pym, which is also a retelling of Poe's narrative. And to plunge further into that recreative of this, Johnson is one of the staff writers on the fall. The fourth season of HBO's True Detective, released just this year and written and directed by Mexican filmmaker Isa Lopez, sets the grisly murders at the center of its Alaskan drama at Salal Station. That place name will be instantly recognizable to readers of Poe and once again Johnson to say nothing of Jules Verne and H.P. Lovecraft. The claim Emron Esplin and Margarita Valdivigato make in the introduction to anthologizing Poe, editions, translation, and transnational canons that, quote, Poe wields more influence in the spheres of literature and popular culture on a world scale than any other U.S. American author, end quote, seems truer now than ever. At any rate, Poe's presence in popular media, and specifically in television, has become so noticeable that this year's CFP for the Post Studies Association sponsored panel at the MLA is titled uh, Poe Lives on Netflix. And it invites contributors to consider how several series on Netflix quote adapt, revise, riff off, rip off, and or revisit Poe's life and literature. And so today I want to look at how Mike Flanagan returns to and revises Poe in the fall of the House of Usher. A decades-long account, the show spans seven years from 1953 to 2023, of siblings Roderick and Madeline Usher's rise to power through a Faustian bargain that leads ultimately to their grisly deaths and to the annihilation of their entire bloodline. Keeping the theme of this year's Jack Williamson lecture, Oh, the Inhumanity, in mind, I address how Flanagan adapts Poe's The Raven specifically its eponymous Asian figure into the inhuman character of Verna in the fall. Flanagan's work generally, and the fall in particular, lends itself to discussions of adaptation and slavery. Most of Flanagan's best-known TV shows and films from Gerald's Game, The Haunting of Hill House, and Dr. Sleep, through The Haunting of Supply Manor, to the next slide. The Midnight Club and the fall, of course, the fall of the House of Usher, to the upcoming Life of Chuck and the Dark Tower are adaptations of well-known horror and gothic stories by people like Emma James, Stephen King, Edgar Allan Poe, uh, Shirley Jackson, etc. In broad strokes, Flanagan's adaptations exemplify what adaptation studies scholars Camilla Elliott and Julie Sanders describe as, respectively, the de and recomposing concept of adaptation and in rethinking the novel film debate, Elliot describes six different categories of adaptation, the fourth of which is what she calls the or recomposition. And Elliot defines this category as one in which novel and film and TV shows, I might add, quote, decompose, merge, and form a new composition, end quote, in which source and adaptation mutually transform and inform each other. The resulting Frankensteinian assemblage galvanizes historically more abundant categories of adaptation criticism, like fidelity, through the application of comparative and translational modes of analysis. For her part, Sanders distinguishes between uh, appropriation from adaptation in the aptly titled Adaptation and Appropriation. Adaptation is characterized by its sustained and unique engagement with the material it translates from one medium to another, while Appropriation, she explains, quote, carries out the same sustained engagement of adaptation, but frequently adopts a posture of critique readily apparent to the audience. The fall certainly engages in length with several known sources. The following slide, you can go to the next slide, lists only some of the stories, poems, and essays which are retold in whole or in part in the fall. I'm not sure how legible that is. You can see the tales and longer works. We have the narrative of Lord Gordon Penn, the fall of House of Usher, Massacre of Death, Black Castle, Bug, Future Burial, The Birth, Game of the Reverse, Murders of the Reward, Castle of Amontillado, and so many, many more. Poems like The Raven for Annie, City of the Sea, and about Lee and Tamerlane, and then essays like The Philosophy of Composition and the Poetic And no, these are only post sources. The list becomes nearly interminable. If we factor in the other sources, such as the Gustave Doré illustrations, like on the title slide, Matt Johnson's novel, the Roger Corman films, the Giallo horror tradition, Flanagan's early works, he's constantly kind of reimagining stuff that he does in the Haunting of Light Manor, the Haunting of Hill House in The Fall of the House of Usher, 
right? Because then it cobbles together these retellings, which exemplify the thesis that Poe advances in the poetic principle and elsewhere, that new literary creations are inevitably novel combinations of already existing works. He cobbles them together into an allegorical critique of the opioid epidemic, global capitalism, and the disastrous effects of both on the environment and animal life. Flanagan appropriates Poe, and in doing so, he decomposes and recomposes the author's works, a la Eliot, so that the fall becomes, like the titular character in William Wilson, an uncanny doppelganger of its putative source material. The show's play of reflection and transformation, revision and fidelity can perhaps best be seen in how the fall recreates Poe's The Raven in the character of Verna, whose name is an anagram, a repetition and a revision of the word Raven. Verna, played by Carla Medina, right in the fall. Poe's poem, all architected in advance, he tells us in the philosophy of composition to achieve its singular emotional effect, links both fancy to fancy, as the grief-stricken narrator bemoans his loss. Amidst his midnight laments, he hears a tapping at his chamber door, which he initially mistakes for some visitor. It's not a human who finally enters the narrator's firelit room, however, but a stately raven. Perching on a bust of Pallas Athena, the bird repeatedly croaks. The narrator, understandably bewildered by this late night turn of events, oscillates between considering the raven as an ominous and as an ominous bird, calling it a prophet, an evil, a bird, and a devil in the same breath. And it's this uncertain ambivalence between animal and fiend, prophet and devil, that Flanagan incorporates into Verna creating an inhuman character, and she, in the season, multiple times, says she's not human, creating an inhuman character that simultaneously embodies and voices, but also contradicts and potentially starts to neutralize the fall's acidic critique of the ushers and the economic, environmental, industrial, and technological violence for which they're responsible. Now, the ushers are a clear stand-in for the Sackler family and their billion-dollar company, Fortunato Pharmaceuticals, with its wonder pill Ligodone, is an obvious doubling of the Sacklers' Purdue Pharma and Mundi Pharma, which built its wealth on the mass distribution and overprescription of opioids like Oxycontin. The fall not only chronicles the death and toll of opioids on human lives and worldwide, the deaths, the deaths are in the millions, Vernon tells Robert, the patriarch of the ushers late in the season, but it also fictionalizes the environmental consequences and fatal costs to animal life that pharmaceutical, medical, and cosmetic industries, and the ushers have their bloody fingers in all three, continually accrue. Flanagan directly addresses these costs in The Murder in the Room Morgue, the third episode of the season. In Murder, we learn that the experimental heart monitoring technology, the Victorine, one of Robert's six adult children, here you love the next slide. The usher plan. Um, one of Roderick's six adult children has developed as being extensively tested despite regulations prohibiting it on chimpanzees. When another of Roderick's children, Camille, and for the sake of time, I'll skip over the wonderfully lucky ability and uh, fighting and plotting of the usher family, um, when she breaks into the lab to document Victorine's animal rights abuses, she's met by Verna, who first adopts the guise of the company's security guard. But Verna's demeanor immediately changes inside the room full of aged chimpanzees. They, and I use the pronoun intentionally, as Verna flatly tells Madeline in another episode, I'm not a woman. They begin to lecture Camille on the long history of scientifically sanctioned animal abuse in Western society. Quote, it was the Greeks who started it, 4th century BCE, first experiments on animals. Over the millennia, those experiments have culminated in hundreds of millions of animals being murdered around the world in laboratories like the ushers. Verna then leaps onto a stainless steel cable and attacks and kills Camille. Just before her death, can you go on to the next slide? <clears throat> Just before her death, Camille snaps a photo of Verna on her iPhone. Sorry, it's a little washed out on the screen. Um, but in the background blur, you have Verna's human visage her face. And then on the iPhone, it's a, a picture of the chimpanzee. Um, Camille snaps a photo of her on her iPhone. It's not a human woman that appears on her screen, 
But in what adaptation studies scholar Tom Sleech would call an obvious updating of the orangutan in code to murders of the reward, is a chimpanzee that the bones strobing flash digitally freezes. Berta's metamorphosis, their almost Elysian becoming animal, redirects the horrors the chimpanzees have suffered back against the human perpetrators of that bloodshed. And in doing so, Flanagan most clearly exposes the critical edge of his appropriation and he or recomposition of Verna as raven, as animal, in the fall. He then tries, however, as Poe is one thing does in his poem, to fuse Verna's animal qualities to the raven as fiend and thing of evil. This juxtaposition, compelling as it may be, produces problems for any coherent reading of the show as it undermines the critical power of Verna's identification with chimpanzees, birds, and cats throughout the series. The false perpetual use of doubling, which draws directly from Poe's many doppelgangers, creates an endless hall of mirrors in which Verna's reflections ceaselessly alternate between animal and devil. Verna's fiendish element is nowhere more evident than in episode six. Gold butt, we can go on to the next slide. While the episode focuses on Tamerlane, Roderick's oldest daughter, and the launch of her Gwyneth Paltrow Duke knockoff beauty and lifestyle product, Vulva, significant screen time is, meant, is spent on the discovery that Verna has appeared in photographs dating back to the start of the 20th century. And in each photograph, they appear with an industrial, agricultural, political, or technological powerhouse. Presented in reverse chronological order, Verna first appears with David Koch, then Mark Zuckerberg, then Gina Reinhardt, the Australian mining typhoon and climate denier, climate change denier, then Brett Kavanaugh, Mitch McConnell, Larry Ellison, the founder of Oracle, Rupert Murdoch, Donald Trump, the Getty family, 20th century oil barons, Prescott Bush, the Bushes, William Randolph Hearst, the Rockefellers, Edward uh, Dupini, another oil baron, the Vanderbilts, and John Queenie, the founder of Monsanto. Given the Faustian bargain that Verna strikes with Roderick and Madeline, their presence in each, their Verna's presence in each snapshot of this rose gallery seems to imply that similar deals have been struck with these titans of industry and political operators to guarantee them a lifetime of wealth and power and a lifetime of inflicting suffering on the world and those around them. Verna describes themselves in another episode as Payne's witness. But episode six seems to reveal they're also its architect. So where does this leave us? On one hand, Verna represents and gives fatal force to the fall's repeated critique of the continual violence against the environment and animal life in post-industrial and neoliberal societies. On the other hand, Verna represents, and fatally empowers, post-industrial and neoliberal societies to wreak continual havoc on the environment and its animal inhabitants. The fall enmeshes its audience through the figure of Verna in the paradox of being human, which can simultaneously mean, according to the OED, not pertaining to or in accordance with what is human in form or nature, so what is non human, animal, organic, or inorganic matter, but inhuman can also mean not having the qualities proper or natural to a human being, destitute of natural kindness or pity, brutal, unfeeling, cruel, the inhuman as inhumane and monstrous and not coincidentally, the ushers are called monsters several times in the fall. Verna is inhuman in both senses of the world, and of the word, excuse me, and the fall makes no overt attempt to reconcile this contradiction or to explain Verna's antithetic nature. This is superficially at least in keeping with the unresolved mysteries that permeate Poe's the Raven. Poe visualizes these enigmas towards the middle of the poem when the narrator throws open the door to his room to see his persistent. In the hall, he sees only, quote, darkness there and nothing more. The ambiguity and nebulousness of that darkness may be effective in the poem, which describes, on one level, the torturous uncertainties of grief. But when it's adapted to the screen and given in human form in Verna's character, those shadows deepen into cracks, threatening to collapse the narrative and ideological cohesion of Flanagan's show, like the house from which the fall draws its doom. We move on to our final panelist for the panel. Uh, here we have Mariah Gomez, uh, who is an associate professor at the Honors College at the University of New Mexico. Her work has appeared in science fiction studies, honors in practice, and Latin American literature today, among other places. Her monograph, Nuclear Nuevo Mexico, 
effects of the nuclear industrial complex on Nuevo Mexicanos relates to her talk today about effects of Los Alamos National Laboratory on nearly by pop and nearby by pop communities. Thank you. Thank you, David. Ooh, I'm um, I want to thank all of the organizers um, of this event, and it's really nice to be introduced to this event by Micah. And what I'm going to be presenting today is a very early draft of a, a part of a bigger project. So I welcome any and all questions and feedback. So the title of the talk today is The Hunter and the Radioactive Deer, Examining the Disruption of Cultural Practices in the Borderlands Go Gothic in Rudolfo Naya's Devil Deer. In Rodolfo Naya's short story, Devil Deer, a Pueblo hunter ascends ancestral hunting lands to kill a deer that he intends to use to sustain life and spiritual practices among his relatives. However, his plans go awry when he kills a deer that the narrator initially describes as deformed. The haunting that overcomes the hunter and his community takes precedence over the haunting image of the deer. This haunting, or what I call the nuclear facultad, is the acute awareness that communicates in images and symbols a deeper awareness of the dystopian effects of living in the shadows of the U.S. nuclear weapons complex. Devil Deer reveals the anxieties rooted in nuclear colonialism and living on the border of a national nuclear laboratory that has been shrouded in secrecy since its inception. The reader is forced to contend with whether or not the story of the Devil Deer is plausible if animals have been deformed by nuclear contamination in the region, or if it is simply science fiction. I argue that this story, like his other nuclear-focused works, is Anaya's critique of how the national nuclear laboratories have disrupted traditional cultural practices in New Mexico and caused real-life hauntings that transcend literary genres. As borderland science fiction scholar Lisa Rivera argues, Examples like Anaya's Devil Deer, quote, point to the existence of an under-examined history in Chicana or cultural practice that employs science fictional metaphors to render experiences of marginalization visible and to imagine alternative scenarios that are at once critically informed and imaginative, end quote. This paper expands on a quickly growing body of work on borderland science fiction by analyzing how the ghosts of nuclear colonialism have made monsters out of non-human life forms, thus disrupting generations of cultural practices for surrounding indigenous communities. My goals are twofold, to present Devil Deer as an example of borderland eco-gothic science fiction, and to examine the facultad created by nuclear colonialism in the borderlands region of Los Alamos, New Mexico. As background, in the early 1940s, Los Alamos became the site for Project Y of the Manhattan Project, the U.S. secret project to build the world's first atomic weapon. Initially, over three dozen Nuevo Mexicanos, that is, Spanish-speaking, regionally identified Mexican Americans, lost their farms and ranches, and local Pueblo peoples lost access to their ancestral and sacred sites. In September 1944, scientists began exploding prototypes of gun implosion devices mini nuclear bombs, and biocannon in Los Alamos, just 10 miles away from the closest pueblo of San Luis This initial colonization of the Pajarito Plateau of Los Alamos began what is now 80 years of ecological contamination of ancestral lands for northern New Mexicans, and polluted not only the environment, but also the social fabric of northern New Mexico, creating what Joseph Masco calls the nuclear borderlands. Today, the Los Alamos National Laboratory continues to build atomic weapons as its primary mission, which was recently revved up by the new plan to produce a minimum of 30 new plutonium pits per year at Los Alamos as part of a new Cold War. That's all fact, factual. Um, although Anaya wrote quite a bit about nuclear issues in New Mexico, nuclear themes are not typically associated with Anaya. I am less concerned with why people do not think of him as a nuclear fiction writer than I am with why Anaya writes nuclear fiction in the first place. In both published and unpublished manuscripts, both of the nuclear era, both the dawn of the nuclear era and the speculative future living with atomic weapons are major themes throughout his body of work. As a section of oh, as a section of a larger project on what I have deemed Anaya's atomic Katsunan, today I will focus on his short story Devil Theory. The larger question in my research interrogates Anaya's construction of nuclear plots in his corpus of work. I analyze how the nuclear industrial complex is responsible for killing Anaya's Mintabatslan, 
that is, a mythologized Chicano homeland that depends on Igbo Hispanos and indigenous peoples keeping land-based cultural practices alive. Or, as Anaya repeatedly writes, quote, the struggles between the old ways and the new, end quote. The old ways are marked by indigenous practices in New Mexico, while the new ways are represented by nuclear technocrats. Before discussing the story in detail, I want to provide a lengthy discussion of genre in order to ground my analysis. Already I have posited that Devil Deer is a borderland of eco-gothic science fiction story, but why? Anaya's more popular works are typically discussed as magical realism, and it would be too easy to call this story magical realism. But Devil Deer is undergirded by science rather than magic. Knowing that this cannot and should not be magical realism, I still struggle with positioning this text as science fiction. For starters, Devil Deer does not quite fit into Catherine S. Ramirez's definition of Chicano futurism, which she argues, quote, articulates colonial and post-colonial histories of indigenismo, mestizaje, hegemony, and survival, end quote. Written by a famed Nuevo Mexicano author who is notably considered the padrino, or godfather, of Chicano literature, Anaya's Devil Deer centers indigeneity and the survival of Pueblo peoples and their traditions in the midst of nuclear hegemony, that is, the Los Alamos National Laboratory. The term Chicano Futurism itself was inspired by the work of Nuevo Mexicana artist Marian C. Martinez, whose mixtec, mixtec art originates at the Los Alamos National Laboratory. Ramirez says of Martinez's work, quote, these works simultaneously speak of New Mexico's unique history as a dumping ground for high-tech trash including radioactive waste and the planet's growing pile of so-called e-waste, end quote. Thus, Chicano futurism is rooted in the nuclear waste at the Los Alamos Laboratory. But Anaya's Devil Deer is not quite the same historical reimagining or decolonial project as Martinez's. Ramirez further defines Chicano futurism as, quote, Chicano cultural production that attends to cultural transformations resulting from new and everyday technologies including their detritus that excavates, creates, and alters narratives of identity, technology, and the future, that interrogates the promises of science and technology, and that redefines humanism and the human." End quote. This story presents the colonial history of, specifically, an indigenous Pueblo community, though not a Chicanx one. And while Indo hispano traditions of Nuevo Mexicanos would fit into this definition, Pueblo traditions lay just outside it. But equally, I do not consider this indigenous futurism for much the same reason. As Grace Dillon explains, indigenous futurism, quote, is not about chronicling the many instances of mainstream science fiction that borrow the victimized noble savage trope in order to relive Wild West fantasies, nor to offer contrition about past injustices, however what mattered, end quote. Chelsea M. Herr adds to that definition that indigenous futurism is, quote, a critical theory that examines the ways in which native artists and writers respond to the use of indigeneity as a trope in popular science fiction, end quote. As a Chicano writer who identifies as mestizo, that is mixed indigenous and European, Anaya's identity is complex, but he is not Pueblo, nor has he ever claimed to be. And while he does not replicate the victimized noble savage trope in this story, he falls short of reimagining an anti-colonial or at least a decolonial future for the indigenous protagonists in his community. Instead, Anaya offers a speculative portrayal of the scientific past, present, and future that the nuclear lab has created for Chicanx and indigenous communities in northern New Mexico, a borderlands region where Los Alamos is located. As I have argued elsewhere, the Los Alamos borderlands is the space inhabited for living and or working by indigenous peoples in Nuevo Mexicanos and shared with non-native New Mexicans who immigrated or migrated to New Mexico to work at Los Alamos for the nuclear colonial project. A critical regional analysis of this Los Alamos borderlands region reveals that the ways in which nuclear weapons are mass produced at this factory of sorts creates one such neoliberal economic hegemony that is, that is examined in borderland science fiction. Rivetta says that, quote, borderland science fiction texts not only offer critical visions of globalization, both today and in the near future, but also insist on reading late capitalism as a troubling and enduring extension of colonial relations of power between West and Mexico, end quote. I would extend that for the purposes of my argument to the power relations between the U.S., Mexico, and the rest of the third world through nuclear weaponry and the threat of nuclear annihilation. Among the various subgenres of the growing examination of borderland science fiction is what Micah Donahue calls the borderlands gothic. 
As Callie Hurley explains, the Gothic is, quote, a cyclical genre that reemerges in a time of cultural stress in order to negotiate anxieties for its readership by working through them in displaced, sometimes supernaturalized form. Monsters specifically are said to embody these fears as they are designed, like their name suggests, to reveal and warn. Accordingly, monsters are the ultimate incorporation of our anxieties about history, about identity, about our very humanity, end quote. In Devil Deer, Anaya uses science to create monsters out of animals as a way to invoke a deep anxiety about the history and future of nuclear colonialism the ever, and the ever-growing market for nuclear weapons manufactured as it intertwines with indigenous and Nuevo Mexicano's identity reformation. Donahue writes that the uncanniness of the Gothic, whether it's in traditional or cybernetic guise, maps onto the uncanniness of the borderlands and in between the Gothic space that similarly fuses opposites and conjugates distinct temporality. End quote. Additionally, I would add that the eco Gothic provides an opportunity to express fear and anxiety over the alienation of humans from the natural world through environmental violence. Ana Maria Putis writes that Borderlands Eco-Gothic highlights, quote, ecological awareness of Latinx fiction and its novel ways of using horror and fantasy to effect incisive social and environmental critique, end quote. As such, I seek to analyze Devil Deer using the same Borderlands Eco-Gothic science fiction lens. Devil Deer is set between the Los Alamos National Laboratory atop the Pajarito Plateau and a local Tewa Pueblo, which goes unnamed but probably San Vicente or Santa Clara, as these are the two closest pueblos that border the Los Alamos County perimeter sometime in the near future. The Pueblo men have stopped hunting the ridge above their community because the Los Alamos Laboratory fenced off part of the ridge that now flows yellow at night. Anaya writes that, quote, nobody hunted near the fence. The ridge lay silent and ominous on the side of the mountain. On the other side of the ridge lay Los Alamos, the laboratories, plural. And nobody knew what in the hell went on there. But whatever it was, it was seeping into the earth, seeping into the animals of the forest. To live within the fence was deadly, and now there were holes in the fence." End quote. Cruz, the story's protagonist and a Pueblo man, prepares to go hunt the ridge by himself against his better judgment. The night before his hunt, a bear appears to him in a dream. The narrator describes the bear, quote, one paw was twisted like an old root tree root, the other was missing. The legs were gnarled and the huge animal walked like an old man with arthritis. The face was deformed, the mouth dripping with saliva. Only the eyes were clear as it looked at Cruz. Go away, it said, go away from this place. Not even the medicine men of your grandfathers can help you here, end quote. Cruz describes the bear as both brother and monster. The word monster derives from the Latin monere, meaning to warn, and monstrare, meaning to show. Here, the monster warns Cruz about what is to come, but he ignores the warning and proceeds with his hunt. Cruz quickly sights and shoots a deer the next day during his hunt, but after tracking it, he finally comes face to face with it, only to encounter a monster similar to, bit, to the bear in his dream the previous night. Anaya writes, quote, There were patches of hair growing on the deer's antlers. The deer was deformed. The hide was torn and bleeding in places, and a green vial seeped from the holes the bullets had made. The hair on the antlers looked like mangy human hair, and the eyes were two white stones mottled with blood. The buck was blind. Its legs were bent and gnarled. That's why it didn't bound away. The tail was long, like a donkey tail." End quote. This description of the deer fosters Cruz's nuclear facultad. Gloria Ansaldúa defines la facultad as a sixth sense. She, said is the, she says it is the capacity to see in surface phenomena the meaning of deeper realities to see the deep structure below the surface. It is an instant sensing, a quick perception arrived at without conscious reasoning. It is an acute awareness mediated for the part of the psyche that does not speak, that communicates in images and symbols, which are the faces of feelings, that is, behind which feelings reside and hide. The one possessing this sensitivity is excruciatingly alive to the world, end quote. The deer becomes the symbol of Cruz's ecophobia of the laboratory changing organisms into nuclear abominations. The description of the monster deer is overshadowed by the haunting that overcomes Cruz. He cannot bless the deer and he cannot feed it to his family. As the narrator says, quote, he could not raise the buck's head and offer the breath of life to his people. He couldn't offer the cornmeal. 
He was afraid to touch the book, but something told him he couldn't leave the deer on the mountain side. He had to get it back to the pueblo. He had to let the old men see it, end quote. The purpose of having to return the deer to, to let the elders see it is Cruz's attempt not to suffer the haunting alone. Additionally, he needs verification that this monster deer exists, and he knows that it is not an isolated case. As the hole in the fence exists, he and the Pueblo are facing a new reality that, that has now disrupted their cultural practice of deer hunting, which serves both spiritual and elemental purposes. Cruz's anxiety over the laboratory lay in the fact that it has always been a secret project. The U.S. government, since first evicting Pueblo peoples and Nuevo Mexicanos, made a workforce of local populations since the outset of the project. But that alienation has developed in part due to the compartmentalization that occurs there. In other words, most of the workers do not see themselves as part of a continued atomic weapons building project. As a result, the workers are alienated from their jobs and their home communities simultaneously. The disruption of the cultural practice of hunting is further demonstration of that alienation. Quote, what kind of devil machines were they running over in the labs that made the earth tremble? Accelerators? Plutonium? Atom smashers? What do I know, Cruz thought. I only know I want my brother to return to the Pueblo with me, feed my family venison steaks with fried potatoes and onions, end quote. Cruz cannot feed the deer to his family, though. With its green bile, human hair, and mottled bleeding eyes, Anaya invokes an elementary, an elementary gothic here. As Kirsten Olaf explains, quote, the elementary Gothic expresses anxieties around food delocalization and food scarcity, as well as the dispossessions and proletarianization of the farming class and the alienation of workers from lands increasingly employed for the export production, end quote. The farmers were removed from the Pajarito Plateau in the 1940s and turned them into a proletariat working class. Anaya does not address that in the story, but the anxiety around venison scarcity is central to his critique of the nuclear laboratory. In the article, man was not made to know so much, Rudolfo Anaya and the nuclear age, Daniel Avino argues that the devil deer may be a fictional victim, but Anaya's creation of it expresses his anxiety over the secret lab that from his perspective prioritizes nuclear technology over environmental conservation. This imposition Eagle imperialist in nature will force the indigenous community to reconsider or even abandon traditional hunting practices and depend more on Western ways of life, such as buying processed foods at supermarkets. In the dystopian future that Avino supposes and Anaya confronts, contamination at the lab poisons the animals and disrupts traditional cultural practices in New Mexico, forcing indigenous populations to abandon traditional hunting practices. Muthis posits that, quote, Gothic fiction's ability to give shape to invisible threats and to expose our cultural anxieties in a displaced and sometimes supernatural form takes an ecological turn when those fears revolve around environmental destruction and the alienation of nature, end quote. As Cruz searches for the deer in the thick forest after he shoots the animal, he exhibits anxiety about the laboratory and the type of science that is performed there. When he finally reaches the deer to find that it is mutated beyond his comprehension, it is unclear to the audience whether the animal was intentionally made this way or whether it was exposed to whatever was seeping out of the lab and into the ground. Nonetheless, his sense that something was wrong is proven true and the deer, like the bear from the night before, becomes a symbol of the environmental destruction and alienation of nature that the lab has caused. A 1999 study published by the Los Alamos National Laboratory tested the radiation levels in elk and deer collected within laboratory boundaries. The report states that, quote, as a group, most radionuclides in muscle and bone of deer and elk from Lano lands were not significantly higher than in similar tissues from deer and elk collected from background levels, end quote. In other words, very few of the animals tested contained radionuclide concentrations above background levels. However, there were several animals that tested extremely high for cesium-137 and strontium-90. According to the study, quote, the deer was collected on a mesotop that was located between two canyons at Lano that have a known history of 137 cesium and 90 strontium contamination, end quote. The study concludes, quote, as a result of all the collected elk and deer samples show that laboratory operations do not result in significant impacts to the general public from consuming meat and or bone from elk or deer that inhabit Lionel lands, end quote. 
Despite this study and others like it, local communities employ a nuclear bomb bug in which they sense that their homelands are being contaminated by the polluting nuclear industries and altered their ways of life. Devil Deer ends demographically speculative in that a new story, quote, a new story would grow up around Cruz, the man who killed the Devil Deer. Even his grandchildren would hear the story in the future, end quote. The deer serves as a prophecy of what is to come from the and how globalization and neoliberalism are implicated. I have hinted at the increase in production of nuclear weapons that is taking place today in Los Alamos, meaning that there will be an increase in nuclear waste production with no plans of how to dispose of that waste. And so it will continue to seep into the earth and the ecosystem, and Cruz and, as Cruz and Anaya imagine. Anaya's work is laden with nuclear anxiety. I often wonder why Anaya never crossed that hump of writing a nuclear apocalyptic novel or even that short story. But every time I find myself thinking about it, I realize that it was because he could not imagine a world where Indo Hispanos had to perish, even if that meant perish, even if that meant perish as a way for survival. Thank you. Thank you all. These are some of these fantastic papers. Uh, so we do have uh, some time for questions, if anybody has any. If not, I always have questions. Yeah, I have a question for uh, Sarah. Thank you so much for talking about uh, this book. I'm so glad to hear that it is a So I'm, I'm interested in the tribes, how they kind of become uh, a national their tribal elements behind. Um, and uh, this idea of they name themselves the Indian Federation. They name themselves the Indian Nations. Okay, the Indian Nation. I wrote New Federation. I'm like, oh my god, 1969, this is Star Trek. Like, you know, is it that they are envisioning kind of themselves? I guess. Part of my question, and, and, and part of it is a comment, it also seems like they have lost their tribal identities throughout this, this process, right? And it is now, it is now maybe an Indian nation that they see themselves as, right? Is this a problem in, in the novel, the loss of that, those tribal, those tribal identities? So, the tribal identities, change and evolve, but uh, remain still a little different. Um, so initially, uh, when the wars are being fought against the US in the 1870s and 1880s, uh, the Plains tribes who know the region and are already militarized by necessity and almost culturally, are sort of the culturally dominant ones. Um, but uh, once the nation building part starts happening, then other tribal nations with different cultural traditions become more ascendant. So when uh, it becomes uh, necessary to grow crops, then the, the farming nations, the the five nations, right, the Creek, Muscogee, Cherokee, Choctaw, and Seminoles, uh, become the ones who teach the other tribal nations from the Great Plains, who are generally not farmers, how to farm. Um, uh, the Cherokees, who already had cities in the southeast before the Trail of Tears and that ethnic cleansing happens, um, help to organize things like a census and a postal service. Um, but there's still a lot of tension. So for instance, there's a civil war uh, that happens within the Indian nation. Uh, that in the end, it's, it's, it's um, the Apache uh, who uh, foment the civil war. Uh, and uh, it ends with the death of Geronimo um, in, a, in actually an amazing scene in which he talks about 
uh, how the Apache went into this endeavor thinking that they would therefore be able to live in a place where they could continue uh, the traditional lives they had had before colonization, um, but they're being forced to change too much. So it's presented as as uh, as as something that causes division within the Indian nation. Although after the end of the Civil War, uh, the tribes sort of come more to an agreement how how to live together and still maintain separate identities while still having to also have a council of chiefs that will impose a kind of federal uh, policy management. Yeah, so they do have a federalized they do. system, but based on the longhouse, retain yep. their their tribal identities. Yeah. Next question. Um, I was struck by how the uh, the Indian nation of animals sort of corresponds in my kind of this both and representation of her as animal and as victim on the one hand, but also we see her as an animal attacking back and challenging kind of human power and human violence. Um, but then there's also this representation of Verna as this kind of devilish fiend, as death, as the kind of motor um, for suffering and pain in a post-industrial neoliberal world. And it, like I said in the paper, you just get this kind of endless play of reflections there. Right? So all of, if you've seen the show, it's kind of, I didn't have time to go into this particular scene in the paper, um, but for me, it's really powerfully visualized in, um, I think it's episode six again, in Gold Bug, when Tamara Lane is in her house, and you see Verna reflected again and again in the mirrors in her house, or her apartment in the house. Um, and she's continually trying to shatter those mirrors, but shattering the mirror only creates more reflections and shards of glass, and so it just multiplies endlessly, endlessly, endlessly. And just in this play of reflections, which on the one hand is sort of visually stunning, but kind of ideologically and in terms of narrative, um, really problematic for what the show ultimately is trying to say with Bernstein. Yeah, I, I was taking a lot of notes of the time when we got to that part of the paper. Um, I think for me, Based on your comment, one thing that stands out is that the animal is both devil but also docile. Um, and I think in this way, Anaya is playing with this trope of the victimizing the as a person, right? I think that the, the fence plays a really important role in the story because, and it's not just, just the fence as a pulling the border, but it's the hole in the fence because the hole allows. Um, crews to both go through and access to get onto laboratory lands, but it also moves the frontier um, cross through it, so it's a permeable, very careful border. And so in the longer paper, I get to the point where I'm talking about animator sensitivity and how from the Pueblo and indigenous world view, you know, these are not, these are not just, just animal people that are thinking about it. So I think it, it really is a reimagining of how um, how the nuclear industrial complex through these borders and the holes in the borders force indigenous communities um, to have to kind of reimagine their stories and their origin story and their future, right? And so while the story itself doesn't seem like you know it's, it's indigenous futurism at large or you know first and foremost and fantasy dystopian, 
it really is a sort of reimagining of Oxford story. And I think um, at the center of all of that discussion is when Cruz asks, why is the air about to be here? That's his actual question. And so you know, that's the question that I'm pursuing. Why is the air about to be here? Any questions? I've got, oh yeah, please mind. <laughs> um, I'm curious like, why, uh, what if it's not ethically consistent, right? Um, could there be a different agenda going on? Maybe speaking something theological or psychological about human nature and nature of people. Like, why can't it just be? Senseless and the one that's born with uh, ambiguity and tendency and contradiction, and then rather than we want this uh, ethically coherent narrative. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's a uh, fine reading of what Flanagan is trying to do, except that everything he does is sort of crystallized in this symbol of Burnham, right? right? So, like, same time as you're trying to put together this senseless, almost realistic explanation of the world, what's happening in the world, he's also trying to put together this very sensible and simple driven representation that's metaphorically giving meaning to what's happening. So it, I think that, again, the show <clears throat> may be trying to produce some of what you're describing, but it kind of um, unravels its own narrative cohesion in doing that. Well, I've got something uh, in this big general conversation. Uh, it's actually uh, more of like a, a question in the sense of I'd love to see your opinions in, in, in this context. So for Sarah, uh, there is a comic, put up on Image Comics, called East of West. And it does something uh, in a similar fashion to the text you're engaging with, uh, where we have like a reconceptualized future where we have uh, indigenous nations in relation to their form. And are interacting with also other nations uh, in this kind of alternate history, the Civil War fractured, and so several nations are not just all together. Interestingly enough, it has many, many interesting and engaging elements, while simultaneously having many problematic elements. But I, I thought in particular of this, in, when you're discussing this kind of the, the, the identity of these native nations going forward in these various futures and how they have to shift and change based on some other elements, yet somehow still maintain some. I think it would be interesting to read. You know, I would I'd be curious to see what you had to say about that as well. So, I don't know this comment. Who are they? Oh, I yeah, I'll have to look at I don't know. And actually, I was wondering that myself, which is a big question. There's there's a, actually quite a number of native authors, speculative fiction novels that imagine alternate histories resulting in sovereign indigenous nations. Um, William Sanders, who was Cherokee, uh, wrote an alt history, uh, weirdly similar, uh, uh, in which a native nation is established in the Great Plains, but it, it has its sort of split in the timeline much earlier. Um, and it, it engages with a lot of the same uh, complications of uh, how, to, how to have a pan-Indian nation um, while still maintaining individual identities. And part of what everyone I've read has to deal with is that colonial powers won't just leave an Indian nation alone. Therefore, a more uh, organized federation kind of structure is always needed because they're always under attack. Um, <laughs> which I think is probably the most historically accurate <laughs> uh, part of these imaginations, um, which then I would say uh, what we're seeing is that the difficulties of maintaining indigenous identities in these imaginary nations result not necessarily from the problem of Indian nations engaging with each other, but from the stresses of constantly being under colonial attack. Yeah. Oh, thank you. That's really interesting.
we are out of time now, so we have to get set up for our next event. That's perhaps I should have hesitated with my last question. That's my apologies here. Um, first, I'd like to thank our panelists here. For the <laughs> after the we have programs on the table just outside the door here. Um, we have events for the lecture training happening all the rest of today, as well as Connie's workshop tomorrow. Uh, please join us. We have, in just a few minutes here, our guest of honor reading with Martha, uh, Martha Wells, which we look forward to. We'll be assigning after that, and we have our keynote lunch at 12. Uh, if you have any questions, please let me know, but please come back and join us for the rest of this event. Oh, and sorry, one more thing related to this. We have another academic panel. So we have, we have multiple panels happening this afternoon, starting at 3 at the Jacqueline School of Arts Building, but we have another academic panel at 410 with three more academic papers. So please join us for all of these events. Thank you. Thank you.